Welcome everybody to Fantastic Farming number four. My name is Chuck Kayser. I am the founder of Midori Farm in Kyoto, Japan. And I'm joined by my wonderful co-host, John Walsh from Tokyo. And we are gonna talk about farmers diversifying, why they're doing it and how they're doing it. As for myself, I've been a farmer for about 10 years now, seriously for five or six selling vegetables regularly. And just last year, I went full time, gave up all my other jobs to learn that, well, making a living growing organic vegetables on a small scale is pretty difficult to do. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today, about why farmers have to diversify and what they're doing to do it. Because basically, trying to make ends meet by selling organic vegetables is really, really hard. But some of the successes we have and some of the things we take home that's not necessarily money are we take home a great health a great sense of uh, participation in our environmental efforts, uh, great community support, a uh, very healthy body by eating these vegetables, working outside in all weather, um, learning how to grow food the natural way. It's a really wonderful lifestyle, just a, just a tough way to make a living is about all. So um, what I've been doing myself is I've been running some tours. I've been doing some volunteers, doing some events and some other things to try to diversify that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> In my research, I've found that even the Japanese farmers are also struggling, whether, whether they're uh, organic or conventional, you have to be above a certain size, it seems, and a certain sort of industrial uh, infrastructure to really make a living in this business. And I've listened to a lot of farm podcasts and radio shows and things like that to, to kind of get a sense of how are other farmers across the world uh, making it work? How are they able to create a sustainable business with sustainable agriculture? Um, and why are people turning away from sustainable agriculture? Um, I know there's a lot of questions out there about people. Well, what is organic? How do you define organics? And what is certified organic versus, uh, well, I'm self-claimed organic and all that and all that business. And it's a, it's a lot to talk about, a lot to think about. And we're not going to cover that too much today. But just to address it briefly, basically, in organic agriculture, we have a tendency towards sustainability. In my mind, uh, if when you open a business, whether you're selling shoes, uh, opening a cafe, or running an online business, your first and foremost priority is your bottom line financially. You've got to make it work financially. Otherwise, you just can't stay afloat. And that's true for any and all business, including organic farming. For me, an organic farmer is going to look at three other elements. <clears throat> of course, they're going to have that financial bottom line that they have to keep track of, but they're also going to look at their impact on the environment. They're going to look at their impact on their community. And finally, they're going to look at the quality of life for the farmer. And that's, that's one that a lot of people don't consider. Many people might think, well, they've got the income. You know, that's their quality of life. They've got the sense of, oh, they're participating in environmental efforts and the community. That's their quality of life. And don't get me wrong. Those are incredibly uh, valuable things to have in our lives. However, if a farmer is forced to work six days a week on their farm and on their day off, they have to go to the farmer's market for eight or 10 hours, driving out there, setting everything up and dealing with customers all day, then packing it up and coming on home only the next day to wake up at 4 a.m. and hit the farm again. That doesn't translate into an incredible quality of life for the kind of farmer like me, who's also a family guy, you know, who wants to spend time with my child on the weekend or on the days off, take them out fishing or camping or hiking. Of course, I take my son to the farm. All us farmers probably take our kids to the field once in a while even against their will. But this quality of life is very important for us organic farmers so we can sustain ourselves in what we're doing. So we can feel not only good about what we're doing, but we can have a break. We can, gosh, 
heaven forbid, we could even have a small vacation and travel somewhere and go see other places and meet people and talk to people and be involved with social circles. This is the kind of quality of life that I'm talking about. We organic farmers are often lacking because we're working so hard every day to try to make this business work. So today we're going to talk about things like that. For now, I'm going to hand over to my good friend, John, and he's going to introduce some things to you. Take it away, John. Thanks a lot, Chuck. That was really good. Um, thanks a lot for coming. This is um, Fantastic Farming uh, uh, number four. Um, uh, uh, what I'm sort of basically going to be talking about mainly today is how to grow with your farmer. So we're sort of basically going to be looking at different ways that ordinary people can connect with um, urban farmers like myself and uh, countryside farmers like Chuck and many others who are outside uh, out there basically growing their own food. Um, just a bit of background about myself first. Um, unlike Chuck, uh, um, um, I don't grow food. I, uh, I don't um, sell food, but I sell services. And I basically sell um, um, urban farming training. Um, urban farming consulting for people that want to learn how to grow their own food at home. And I basically I uh, set up gardens for uh, private homeowners and schools and hotels and businesses and so on around Tokyo. I've done 60 so far to date. Um, and I've taught um, coming on 1,500 uh, people, mainly school students, how to grow food. And the whole main point behind this whole thing is just to sort of basically wind back the clock and to get people to learn how to grow food like our grandparents did, which to me was naturally. And that was a time when we didn't have this word um, organic. Um, they just used to call food, food. And it was just real food with no pesticides. Um, so I'm basically, I'm trying to basically move people f forward by taking people back and basically sort of trying to bring back um, natural farming practices to people now. Uh, um, um, here in the present so that our future can be more sustainable and it's working it's working really well um demand for my school training services in particular is taking off um covid's been driving that surprisingly um when covid uh, basically just shut down most of the world um it's actually sort of made many people realize hey um growing food yourself at home is a great idea um especially when it's not safe or hasn't been safe to go outside to the supermarket to buy food and it hasn't been safe to mix with people um, and when people sort of put that fact together with the fact that we all need food the uh, natural intersection that comes out is basically uh, grow your own food where you live which is urban farming and um yeah and um urban farming seems to be taking off in a, a lot of major centers around the world especially um um, New York, uh, Boston, London, you name it, Sydney. Um, it's taking off in uh, uh, places like um, Singapore, which have next to no uh, land to grow food on. Um, it seems that it's coming back. It's coming back. But that's not quite the right way to describe it, because um, when I say that um, natural, um, that skills to grow food are coming back, they've never been lost. They've just been lost or haven't or have not been passed down to many people like us who live in the big cities. But the people like Chuck and the countryside farmers and people who live in the countryside, many of them have their own gardens and that's totally natural. And their kids grow up and they sort of running around gardens, playing around gardens, seeing fresh food in the ground every day, which is completely different from what people like myself and others in big cities like Tokyo. We never see food or um, really rarely see food growing. And um, so, yeah, I sort of basically want to bring back food, uh, bring back natural food practices, and it's working. Um, so, yep, um, yep. So that's that's uh, that's uh, mainly what I do. Um, if you want to go for it, uh, Greg. Thank you. Just looking for the unmute button. Um, Thanks a lot, John, for bringing me into this. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Um, so I am a founding member of Farm Fresh KK, um, currently uh, traveling in the US, but I'm a resident of Japan for 12 years. And um, I'll see if I have time to share the screen here. Um, 
We are an online e-commerce business um, bringing organic produce uh, at the moment to the English speaking or foreign community of Tokyo or, or actually, actually all of Japan, really. Um, not just Tokyo, a lot of different places. So uh, at the moment, I am more of a facilitator than an actual farmer. Um, it could be one day that I do get more into the farming. Um, you know, I, I think what, what we're looking to do uh, meshes a lot with what John just said. Um, first of all, it's, it's just a convenient service for people that have an interest, of course. But, um, you know, our, we have a deep interest in well as well. Uh, we're very focused on rural development. Um, at the moment, our primary farm is in Takasaki in Gunma Prefecture. Uh, it's actually an interesting story. Our farmer, our chief farmer, um, he took over his own family's farmland um, about just a few years ago. And um, so I think he's really getting back to the earth, so to speak. Um, he had a career in the food distribution industry. So I think he has seen the corporatization of the food supply very much up close, uh, decided to return home to his family farm and become an organic farmer. Um, we have been in business for about one year. We are um, setting up some meetings with other regions um, that, that could include Yamanashi Prefecture, Tochigi, uh, Niigata, uh, we're in touch with people. And when I return to Japan in about a week, there are some meetings set up. Um, but really, I, I think it goes with what Chuck mentioned also. Um, yeah, I, I'm learning that it's certainly a challenge to, to make this type of business work. But I think what we look to do is, is help facilitate the process and through our marketing efforts, um, it's great to spread the word, so to speak. I, I think there is real interest out there for uh, consumers and people in general, just to um, either reconnect with the earth or, or I, I think it hits people after a while that food does not grow in a supermarket um, at, at National Azabu or anywhere. So uh, that does come from somewhere. Um, we're in touch with several schools at the moment about bringing students out to the farm uh, to learn about organic farming. And um, you know, we, we're also setting up a camp uh, area up in Takasaki, and who knows if we'll do that in other regions as well, but we would love for people to get out to these regions as well, uh, promote the regions, um, you know, help stimulate their local economies if we can, and uh, just do whatever we can. That, that's, that's a bit of an overview on our business. Uh, been in business about a year. Um, funny enough, in the USA at the moment, I, I have done some research on what's happening over here. Uh, I'm actually in the state of Michigan at the moment. I'm not from Michigan. I have some friends and cousins here. Um, apparently in the city of Detroit, which has experienced some decline over the years, um, you, you know, people talk about reviving cities and often it revolves around uh, building apartments or uh, making something a tech hub. They're starting to farm in Detroit. And um, this could, I, you know, there's no better way to revive an area than taking what comes out of the ground. I was just fascinated by this. So this is something I'm going to be looking into more. Um, yeah, Detroit is, is um, you know, we probably have people of multiple nationalities here, but they, they had a population of 2 million. It's down to 700,000 and within the city right now. So one of the biggest stories of urban decline maybe in, on the planet, but, um, Farming is becoming big, and and uh, you know you've got a huge city here. That's just something I wanted to throw out there as I'm in the United States at the moment, and I I, I see this really catching on in the coming years. Uh, people just saying, hey, you know, there's a lot more than than the supermarkets, um, especially us as well with organic farming. Um, I, I was explaining to our farmer up in Takasaki. Um, you know, the, the tragic situation over in Ukraine has, has sent some supply shocks of fertilizer around the world. Um, organic farming does not use any of that. So uh, there you are right there becoming self-sufficient. We're very interested in that as well. And, and I certainly, uh, from my experience meeting John, I know he's a huge proponent of this and 
um, that, that self-sufficiency, and I, I think this could really make a comeback. And as John said, they used to just call it food. Uh, so uh, that, that's a bit of an overview. Thank you. That's like that was great, Greg. I'm really impressed with what you're doing there. Um, I can Thanks. see why uh, you're friends with John and John's friends with you. You guys have a lot of similar ideas. There. Um, you said your biggest or chief farm is in Takasaki, is that right? That's, that's correct. Uh, at the moment, um, and it, I think if we, if we do get other regions on board for now, Takasaki will be sort of a central gathering point. Um, we do have customers in Kansai, even as far as Kagawa up in Hokkaido as well. Um, that's, that's where we got our starts, but that's uh, certainly probably will not be our finish. Now, where is Takasaki? I'm sorry, my geography is not what it should be. I don't know what it <laughs> That's a, I, you know, I, I had never been there either. I, I think I had passed it on the way to skiing on the Shinkansen. It's about two hours direct north of Tokyo. If you take the Joetsu Shinkansen out of Tokyo Station, mm -hmm. um, it's about uh, maybe just under an hour away. Uh, so it's Gunma Prefecture, um, just past Saitama. Go, go north to Saitama right, next sure. year up in yeah. Gunma. So that area was probably heavily affected by the uh, nuclear reactor disaster uh, 10 or 11 years ago, wasn't it? Um, I would have to ask more about that. I mean, certainly uh, Fukushima um, was, um, Takasaki and Gunma Prefecture is pretty far out from where the center of the disaster was. Uh, I haven't heard anything about anything being directly affected. Uh, I'd be interested to find out. I, I can certainly ask next time I'm up there. Well, I'm, I mean, in that in that uh, vein, what you're doing to kind of rejuvenate and revitalize communities and farmland is going to be very welcomed, I think, in that area, regardless. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that, because it was basically from Fukushima all the way down to Tokyo that people were really experiencing unrest at the low end of the scale and uh you know just panic at the high end of the scale as far as what was happening and and what the soil and the water and the living conditions were going to be like for the next 50 years i mean there's been a lot of talk about it so yeah again you're in the right place at the right time uh, especially on the let's hope the tail end of COVID. Um, so uh, that's brought a lot of stress as well. <clears throat> as far as uh, getting vegetables out there, shipping vegetables, a lot of trouble the first year of COVID because drivers just couldn't cross borders. And a lot of vegetables were just dying in the packing sheds, uh, rotting away and not getting to the people that needed them. And like you mentioned about the Ukraine, um, due to other tragic reasons, uh, they're being shut down as far as not being able to do their exporting business. So like you said, the fertilizers, which you're correct, we we're organic, we organic farmers do not really have much effect from that. But of course, the other things like them exporting flour, one of their chief exports has been affecting the prices of flour here in Japan. But um, one of the questions I have for you, though, is uh, what do you think are some of your biggest hurdles in trying to get other farmers on board or present your, your case to other farmers? What kind of hurdles do you have for that? Sure. At the moment, uh, it might just be the, the fact that with organic farming, the supply and demand go very hand in hand. And, and I'm probably talking to the right crowd here. Too many vegetables, not enough people to consume them. You've got wasted vegetables. Too many customers and not enough vegetables. You have unhappy customers. So um, probably getting our... Um, uh, subscriber base up a bit more our customer base is going to be a challenge and that that's one reason we really have held off on um, talking to other regions so that that's um, I'm sure I'll learn more about the barriers as we speak to new regions um, it, it might be more of an internal challenge for now at the same time I'm learning the challenges that our own farmer has um, and and he, there, there's a few other farms in the community, also organic, that he'll collaborate with at times. Um, 
it, it, uh, to, to build up his supply is also a challenge. And in fact, that's one reason we're going to start to talk to other farms and, and source from other places is that um, I think in the modern world, um, with everything at your supermarket, consumers are used to going in there and coming out with whatever they want. So um, the way we can possibly duplicate that is, you know, let's say let's find a strong carrot farmer, whereas our farmer may not have uh, as much in the way of carrots, he may have other things. Um, our farmer has a lot of very good um, native Japanese products like kakina, for example, or um, uh, the sato imo, which, which uh, it's not really Japanese, but it, it, it doesn't really necessarily appeal to the foreign palate. Mm -hmm. um, so bringing him on board and, and meshing that with what our customer base wants. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I've, I've sort of expanded upon your question, but the, the challenges come from multiple areas. And I can really see that um, when this is not made in a factory or JA is not just picking up uh, huge loads of everything for the entire country, it's a very step-by-step -step process. Yeah. I think you're speaking our language. I think you're you're hitting the nail right on the head. The industrialization of our food is both our success and downfall, is what I think. <laughs> and I gotta say what you're doing, I support it and I'd love to be on board if it's mm -hmm. possible. And I will help spread the word uh, as I can. Thank you so much. Hi, hey, Greg. Hi, maybe you got something to say, yeah. Um, hello, I'm Chris, I'm um, Greg. Um, thanks a lot for your presentation. That's really, really good. Thank you. Um, just something completely different about marketing. Uh, since I'm uh, like I'm constantly thinking about how to market services uh, that I sell. Um, you mentioned on food in supermarkets, and um, and I'm just sort of wondering, um, like about people like yourself who uh, 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 like promote farmers' foods. Uh, what do you think about the concept of <clears throat> of um, um, know your farmer? as a marketing strategy. And um, uh, one sort of point about that, uh, um, uh, when I was um, doing some preparation for this um, uh, presentation today, I was sort of checking out different um, farmers' websites around Japan. And the one thing that they all got is a, uh, like a profile about who they are, what they do, and why they do it. Um, it seems pretty common, and it's like I mean, these farmers—they're trying to tell their story. And to people like me, um, I'm probably not in the majority, but to people like me, the story behind the food is a really important and motivating and marketing uh, technique or platform that would make someone like me be more likely to want to support a farmer if I know um, why they're growing the food. And, and what their values are, what their principles are. So basically, come, I'm, I'm going back to my question. What do you think about the concept of know your farmer as a marketing strategy? I, I think it's wonderful. And, and our business is a little bit behind on getting that story onto our website. Uh, you know, I guess uh, running and starting up a business, there's a lot of priorities. <laughs> and recently we've had to... Um, retool our website and, and shift everything to a new platform that can scale with us. But once I get back to Japan in a couple of weeks, uh, marketing is a big focus in year two. Um, we, we are sort of finalizing the story about our chief farmer and any other farmers we use. We've had that idea from the beginning that um, consumers interested in this or even who are not interested and hopefully will become interested um, I think that just really improves the connection to everything. If they know who is growing this, where is this coming from? It's absolutely brilliant. And you've actually um, highlighted a huge thing on my to-do list over the next couple of months. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, one sort of key point about this is basically that I'm, I'm back in the day, like uh, in, uh, when our grandparents used to grow food, um, when our grandparents' generation used to grow food, um, they used to know the farmers because many of them were the farmers. <laughs> it's like they were the farmers themselves. And um, these days, um, like people like me who live in the big cities, we have no idea who's growing our food. No idea at all. And most people, I think, just don't care. Um, but there's a whole lot of good reasons to care. 
and to actually get to know your farmer, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to set up this particular um, event today so that people watching could actually meet people like you and like Chuck, who are the people who are growing the food and supporting the farmers so that we can actually get to know you guys and find out who you are, what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah, so. Uh, sure, sure. I have a lot more respect for Chuck because he's actually out there doing this. Uh, in, in my case, I am just telling the story, but um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's um, you know, I, I'm not the real story with Farm Fresh, but what, what we're trying to do is, is get the story about the, the people that are out there uh, in the fields. Um, and and we, we want to give people a chance to come out and meet the farmers as well. So that's something I think we have planned in year two. We would love to increase visits, uh, whether it's schools or, or just uh, adult tourism. Um, but we, we want people to, to see the farmer on the website and then actually come out and see everything as well. That's um, mm. really, really builds the connection. Good stuff. That's really good. <clears throat> That's great. Great question, John. I'm really glad you asked it. And those were excellent answers. I appreciate it. Um, now we're going to hear from a farmer who's uh, somebody that I respect and admire. And I love the apples that she sells. And I hope to be increasing my orders this year because we ate a lot of them. And I know they aren't her apples, but in a way, that's a good thing because she's showing her support for some local people in her own area. Well, I'm not going to introduce her too much because she's got a lot to say for herself. And it's Heather Fukase from Nagano Naturally. Heather, I'm going to spotlight you so that everybody can see you. Take it away. Hi. Wow. Um, what a what a group to be a part of this morning. <laughs> um, I made some notes as I was listening, so I'm sorry, Chuck, I've gone off script. So <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, I think um, Chuck's introduction about uh, like the balance, um, I think balance has been something of a key word for me. Balance between um, like, yeah, financial balance, work-life balance, family balance. Um, I've been uh, growing wheat, rice, vegetables, apples, rhubarb, uh, in the foothills of the Japan Alps in Nagano for about 12 years. I got serious about maybe seven years ago. Um, for me, I will never give up my other job. Um, I'm an English teacher because I like to say I work seven days a week for nine months of the year, and then I work one hour a week for three months. <laughs> um, there's In Nagano, there's no winter farming. Um, there are some places that use greenhouses, but the amount of fuel that it takes to, and plus I, I'm a big believer in living seasonally. So I don't, I haven't eaten a fresh tomato, like, you know, since last year, we can a lot for ourselves, but I, it, I don't want, my style of farming doesn't work with using fuel to heat a greenhouse to make a product that to me is not as good as one I could grow naturally in summer. Um, so yeah, so that balance is really important to me. Um, and I, I'm big on telling my story. My Instagram and Facebook is mostly story, but I kind of, I have issues with the word marketing. I'm, and I'm, I'm a seriously bad business person. Anyone who's been waiting for an email from me, well, <laughs> but so I come at this as I love the vegetables. I love being able to share. And then it didn't make sense to send things to people for free. So it, it became a business. <laughs> so I did actually start by sending things to people for free unasked for so but um so yeah so this I kind of came in at the opposite I didn't start a business I started a farm and then yeah I had so like as um as Greg said I had so many vegetables I was like what do I do with it all and uh so yes yeah, so I came at this backwards which means a lot of things about the way I do things are you know marketing people just like you know hit their head against a wall but I really believe in education that like kids should know. And I think in Japan, public school education does an amazing job with like kinder kids and elementary school kids being aware of the seasons and food. But um, I think especially in, um, I'm, I also work um, like 95% in English, 95% to the foreign community in Japan. And people, I'm very nice people that like, you know, hey, you know, why can't I find apples? And I'm like, well, cause it's July. And they're like, but Costco has them. And I'm like, yeah, but 
and 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 then there's a lot of education and I, I i can come across i think some people find it like or they say why don't you have anything in march and i i've literally taken a photo of my snow covered field and sent it to someone because they didn't believe me they're like but farms in my area have vegetables and i'm like yeah but japan has like these massive climate differences i mean chuck is harvesting things that i'm still like you know <laughs> mine are 10 centimeters high it's it's just a very different and i think that awareness helps people appreciate the vegetables. Um, and I think it can come across as a bit whingy times. I'm very careful not to be like, oh, there's another farmer complaining about the weather again. But at the same time, we're living in an era where you can't depend on it. People cannot depend on um on the weather. We can't, we had no rainy season here. We had the worst spring. We had a hot early spring. And then we had a really cold period and then we had no rainy season, which means everyone's crops were out of whack. Um, the conventional farmers, the organic farmers, everyone. And when your crops are out of whack, people are like, you know, I checked and I ordered from you at this time last year. And I'm like, yeah, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> so I think awareness and I'm, another thing I know I'm really I'm kind of on the outer outer here. I don't like the term support your farmer because I feel like support like means like I, I when I think of a support, I think of a crutch or someone who's unable to stand by themselves. So I'm like, know your farmer, build relationships with your farmer. But I, I like, yeah, I don't know. The word support kind of, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm totally on the, on the like minority here. And I think I'm being a little bit pedantic about wording, but um, I, I feel like we should all be aware of how things work. I, I think part of diversity has to be customers being aware of how the weather is going to change what's available when. And farmers also, um, I, I live in a predominantly apple growing area. For the last two years, sunburn has been a huge issue. Um, it, from the end of June, we had sunshades up in the apple fields this year, which is unheard of. Um, pest. Um, pressure disease pressure is completely different than how it was which means conventional farmers have to up the amount of sprays they're using um because you i mean apples take years to get to full production it's not like you know if i have a kale crop that gets pressed pressure i till it in feed it to the chooks and start again but there are some industries within agriculture where that's just not um, realistic and what is happening is company farm contracts are taking up like grandma and grandpa were happy to, or, you know, not happy. It was their thing to work seven days a week, get up at 430, work before they went to work, come back and do work afterwards. Modern lifestyles, modern family life in Japan is setting aside more time to leisure. And like, I'm not going to blame people for that. Like, I think the old people in my neighborhood still work crazy hours. I'm like, going, okay, see your eyes. <laughs> but um, I think again that's something where we're going to need to look at diversity because i think everyone moving to company farm contracts is really not it's not good not good um for the environment for communities for the way farming is going um they don't live in the neighborhood they send guys out on a rotation um they drive huge john deere equipment in tiny japanese roads there's just so many reasons um and so aggregators like farm fresh are a really great support <laughs> for small farmers because it's hard to be out you've got to be like you know like chuck and i've discussed this but you've got to in your head you've got to have your seeding schedule your weeding schedule what's happening your orders your harvesting your you know you're delivering and then a weather event happens and you're like no i can't do what rain on tuesday that doesn't work for me and then you get home and you got to do your emails and your invoicing and your records and it's sometimes you're just juggling too many balls and i think yeah having aggregators as part of the mix um is something that i think is a really i really hope that catches on because i know a lot of small farms around me a lot of like i live in an area where organic agriculture is quite popular and there's, there's a lot of systems to bring more people in from other industries into agriculture but everyone's trying to start up from zero and have a full um thing and and then a lot of them also do farm stays and they do education because they need the income in the winter because yeah we have no growing so it just becomes yeah so many things to juggle and with unreliable weather i think that's a, a big thing so yeah i really think there's a lot of 
room for diversity, but there's a lot of need for diversity. And I just hope that we can uh, organic slash natural orga uh, agriculture in Japan can continue to be a valuable part and hopefully increase as more people become aware through education. Okay. <laughs> that was super nice and concise too. You did very well. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm guilty of the same thing. Once I start talking about farming, my wife just walks away. She just, no, no, I, I'm not going to be a part of this. Well, I do have just one thing to ask of you, and that is, do you, I know you're networked with some other farmers in your area. Do you know anyone who's really cracked the formula and is able to run, I'm not saying small, but moderate size organic farm for a living? Um. The person who I most respect, and I've actually, I did a, a two year course. He ran a course, a monthly course, which was in the morning theory in the afternoon practice. Um, and I really respect him. And he flat out says, I'm not organic. He said, because he's, he, he's lowered as much as he can. He grows some things without um, blueberries. He grows with nothing. Um, but he grows a lot of soft fruits and just because of the climate here and it just it, every year, like it, there's a different pressure. And also there's another aspect that Japanese farms where I am, I mean, I've been listening to people in Kyushu. It seems like there's more kind of autonomy and bigger areas, but here you're literally like right up against your neighbor. And if you get an outbreak of something on your farm, it's, it's a big deal. And it can, you know, I, 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 when we moved here, there was a farm where someone had gone through with a chain store and felled someone's entire orchard because he'd let, you know, they'd let it go and it was, you know, causing issues for the entire area. So balancing all of that. Um, so yeah, the, I'll, I'll, I'll send you, it's uh, Oguriyama farm in Azumino and he has a moderate size operation by Western standards, a pretty big operation for here. He's got um, blueberries, apples, pears, peaches, nectarines, um, vegetable juice. He also does a lot of the processing, so that that's another way that they do it. They um, they keep things in storage, and then during the winter they'll do processing. Because again, you need a twelve month, <laughs> you need a twelve month income, and where we are, that's not really possible. But he says, I don't grow organically and these are my reasons like this is this is the efforts we make this is how we're looking after the environment this is how we're decreasing as much as possible but these are my realities and this is why this is not 100 percent organic and well but I he get, is he is making a living from farming fruits though yes yes 100 percent. but he is diversifying because he's also teaching other people about that and I, he also has interns from Malaysia. He's got, there's an uni agriculture university in Malaysia. So I know some people are a bit funny about if you have interns or volunteers oh. rather than 100% paid labor. Oh, it's okay. Just I'm trying to figure out these yeah. are the sort of elements that a lot of us farmers are having to bring in when we don't want to have the second job anymore. When we, yeah. Want, yeah. we want to leverage our farms and our vegetables or fruits to their maximum so that we can just focus on the ball rather than yeah. well, the ball is yeah. always there, but I got to go to work for a couple of hours and then come back <laughs> and then pick up the ball again. So I get it. And uh, even when, though he's not organic, I think fruits, especially soft fruits, have got to be really, really difficult to manage organically with all the, I mean, insects, I think this is insectopia is Japan <laughs> because I've never experienced such insect life than I have in Japan. It's just incredibly diverse and wonderful, but challenging to put it nicely. But I mean, he says he does a lot of like hands-on stuff. Like he'll find out something theoretical. I remember last year he mixed up natto with the, the soft part from our, around a ginkgo nut, because that's got some kind of, a, and he mixed up this paste of natto and ginkgo fruit and slathered that on trunks and wrapped it around to see if that could, like the good bacteria and good like stuff could counteract. Like, yeah, so there's, and then he's not the only, there are people around here who are really trying, but this area we don't have really super isolated farms. And I think it's just, it's not, doable to be able to continue to live in your neighborhood <laughs> i get it john do you have any questions for heather yeah. um there's one question heather um thanks a lot for the presentation that was great um what are these um <clears throat> these uh company farms that you mentioned that okay are um yeah what are they 
in a, I've noticed it. Like I, I can only speak to my area because I don't get out much. <laughs> but um, there's a, in the last five or so years, I started seeing these little plates that would be like, uh, this is I don't want to use their real name, but like this is Tanaka Farm number forty-seven. For any like any issues, please call this number and quote this number. And what they're doing is they're contracting because Japanese tax law for unused farmland <laughs> is there's a tax incentive to use farmland, but as yep. you get older, you do, you maybe don't want to use it, but then you don't want to sell it all this, and so the landowners contract with these are uh, there's big ones for soba and rice around me and they literally just come out they do the entire neighborhood they just and these huge trucks and they can just plow in one they plow in and then another truck comes in and seeds the next one and then yeah. they basically don't come back until harvest so and they're, um, they're basically bringing up manpower and machinery to do farming for i'm assuming farmers who can't do it anymore or who don't have the capacity to farm their whole farm. Or they just get, yeah. they get like a, you know, a tiny stipend of money, but they don't have to worry about it. I think the people I know who've joined this kind of thing, it's more, they still farm vegetables or they still farm apples, but they don't want to be also looking after that field and that field and that field. So, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I understand why the farmers are doing it, but to me, when the, the way they do it, they don't care about the land. They don't care about sustainability. My impression, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's very much a business and, yeah, they don't have the ownership, do they? No, like, no. The actual and, owners, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the turnover, I mean, soba is not a high margin mm -hmm. crop. And there's often so much weed pressure that they're just plowing in the crop and then planting again. So mm. I, I, I mean, from a company's perspective, <laughs> I'm imagining there's government subsidies involved because I don't see how it's making it. Oh, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. but yeah. I think it's, it's, whoever's doing it is looking long term and imagining mm. that this is a, I, I imagine this is a scale thing yeah. like the more properties you have and i like i said that, that's my worry that it they, there was a couple and then there's a couple yeah. more and then it there's an incentive to the to the farm yeah. company to have as many fields in the same area as possible and i think that's a loss yeah. to yeah. not have um, small scale farms but on the other hand considering the um aging um, japanese farmer population where like most of them are over uh, like north of 75 or so um, to me, it's a potential lifeline uh, to the farming sector here, um, as opposed to lots of farmland just not being used. Yeah. I mean, if it's being used to grow something, it's like contributing to this country's um, uh, uh, food self-sufficiency. I think it's. I hope. I hope good, there's that's, a third. Hopefully, going to be a good thing. I hope there's a third route where we get more young people. So yeah, we yeah, make, yeah, yeah, yeah. if we can get the agriculture industry to be sustainable, yeah, then more yeah, young people will look yeah. at it. So yeah, I, I yeah. agree with you as yeah. fellow land versus a company farm, in company mm. farm, at least the land is in use and, and being cared for and not just sprayed mm. four mm. times a year mm. to kill everything on it. But I, yeah. I think it goes, it's a disincentive for people to take over the family farm. If mm. they're like, mm. you know, we don't have to do it if we just let those guys. So yeah, hopefully, it's, hopefully there's a third way. <laughs> yeah, it almost sounds like a farming subsidy where the and where the farmers are not just being paid uh, not to grow food, but they're also being paid not to do the work either. And so it's, the, it's, it's like a subsidy, like an unemployment benefit, where you're getting paid to not actually do anything. <laughs> and I think um, for a lot of, especially if you're widowed, um, for a lot of the single women. That single sounds wrong. Like they're, they're like, but the women who they're they used to be quite a traditional division of labor in a lot of families. And if your son does not live in the neighborhood, you don't drive a tractor. So you were paying someone to once a month plow your field so that for tax purposes it looks like it's in use. Now you're being offered not much money, but you're not paying the tractor driver. So like, you know, what I mean, it, it, I, I can totally see how it works. Yep. Yeah. Um. Super cool question. Have you heard of um, uh, fleet farms in the States? F-L-E-E-T? Yes, no, fleet I haven't. farms. It's a company, I think, based in uh, Boston. And what they do is um, uh, like a local, uh, uh, what I think they do is uh, sound like quite a local version of what you're just talking about. And they basically go around to homeowners who have lawns and they walk up to, up to, up to their front door and say, hey, um, you've got a nice front lawn here. Um, what do you like, a garden? And for like about five hundred dollars or so, fleet farms, um, they'll send around their gardening team to, uh, 
either dig up the lawn and um, and set up a garden or set up raised gardens on, on top of the grass. And what they do is they basically say, right, um, the family can take whatever food that they like. It'll cost the family $500 to have the, um, the garden set up at their home. Um, then Fleet Farms takes the rest of um, the food that the family doesn't need uh, and they sell it through local farmers markets. And I think they split the money, they split the profit with the family. So regular families who don't necessarily have any interest in, in gardening can get a garden installed, get a whole pile of food, plus get money from it as well. And that's a business, but uh, it's done just like you're saying on the site of the owner. It's kind of interesting how similar those two business models are. And I'd love to set up that kind of business model here in um, Tokyo, but no one's got lawns. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to work, eh? Not that anyone's got a lawn. We, maybe, we the put roof, in, maybe the rooftops, but not lawns. We put in the lawn and the neighbours brought over some no longer sold, but really good weed killer. I'm like, no, 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 no. the grass is on purpose. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, Chuck. Yep. That yeah. was great. I loved it. And uh, that Fleet Farms, John, if you could put some information in the Farms, chat yep, about we'll that, go. I'm sure yep. people are interested. I got a really Heather, I know that well. Carla is anxious to check out your Instagram. So oh. when you have a moment, just type that in. For now, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to talk about myself and two other farmers a little bit about diversification. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about how to grow with your farmer. And I'm just going to start by talking about my own endeavors at Midori Farm. Uh, for diversification, I've done events, I've brought on volunteers, and I've done tours. And I've had a whole bunch of all of those things. And I found these are a great way to get people involved. As an organic farmer, we're often all by ourselves there out in the field. Um, even conventional farmers must be as well, uh, whether it's on the tractor or on the, on the foot, you know, you're out there in the fields all day, every day, and you don't get a lot of people out there. And as John had said, one of the greatest parts about organic farming is sharing with other people. And it, not only are they interested, but it boosts your sales because people know the story behind the tomatoes and the carrots and the broccoli and the lettuce that they're eating. So this is a wonderful way to get people involved. And uh, my events started out with that's my son holding the little butterfly net there when he was four years old and that was one of my inspirations is all of our kids having them out there lots of groups of people going hiking uh going swimming in the river having some farm events and some other activities seeding some shiitake logs and these things as an english teacher and as a science teacher of which i've been both for about 25 years or so i gotta say these are natural classrooms, these farms and gardens that we work in. So I really think it's a great way to boost education as well as the environment and our food safety, as well as health value to have kids out there all the time. Not only they wanna help with the tilling and then your friends wanna come out as well. And the volunteers have just kept coming. And there's some organizations like Work Away that are wonderful to connect hosts who are uh, farm owners uh, with volunteers from all over the world who wish to come out, learn about organic farming, and to uh, get some experience, meet some new people. And I found that the people who come out are incredibly helpful. Here's a gentleman from Switzerland and another one from France. And they've become just such good friends now, lifelong friends. They meet on the farm and they're just people who always stay connected with me and with each other. It's a great experience. I highly recommend it for the farmer and for the volunteer. Um, I started my tours through Airbnb experiences. Um, this is a great way to get people out who are traveling the world with their children or just with some young adults or even this large family from the Philippines came out as part of their wedding tour. And people just love coming out to the farm, checking things out, having a meal together on the riverside, going hiking, having some fun and things like that. However, of course, 2020 and 2021 and 22 have the COVID factor. And there's been a lot of fallout from, for that, from that for uh, myself and I'm sure other people trying to diversify. Um, but I did take on farming full time. I started farming in Kehoku, which is now my main place to farm rather than Kutsuki, which was before. My YouTube channel is 
about 55, 60 videos now. This video here that I'm making right now, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you very much. Um, we'll be going on there very soon. There's grant programs out there that you can uh, sign up for and apply for some money to help support your efforts, as well as do some online farming events, like kind of like what I'm doing here, except the last one I did, which was just last Monday, the 4th of July, my good friend Thomas out in Hiroshima were on our fields in person, giving a farm tour, and then talking about what we're doing and how we're trying to make things work. So this, all this kind of stuff is really great to bring to the picture of organic farming, to bring farming and organic vegetables into the purview of the average person. I'm gonna try doing some more farm experiences with Japanese folks, because as we know, COVID is not gone. It's hard to get those volunteers here from overseas. It's hard to get those Airbnb travelers. So I'd like to market more towards the Japanese population to try to give them a ego de no gyo taiken, which would just be basically a farm experience in English. Uh, John and I have spoken about this, trying to do some online consulting or in person. And I think this is a wonderful way for people who are trying to set up their own garden to have somebody who, with some experience, give them some good advice. Um, as a personal project, one that I'm doing in Kyoto, uh, if you know of anyone with a sustainable initiative who's trying to get themselves promoted, uh, please tell them about SOS Green Screening. It's an event we'll run this fall to gather as many sustainable initiative videos we can to, to promote them and to show them around so that those small groups and individuals can get the press that they so deserve. Now, why is it that uh, I care so much about farming? Why am I spending my day off podcasting and talking to other farmers? Well, for one thing, I love other farmers. We're all you know, kindred spirits, of course. But also I feel like there is a big message out there that's just not coming through. And I'm not the best person to do it, but I don't see a lot of other people stepping up. So here's what you get. And I look online and I see things like this from National Geographic, less nutritious. Our food is less nutritious. So instead of eating one carrot, now you have to eat two or three to get the same nutritional level and profile that you would have when our parents and grandparents were kids. And this is, of course, because of conventional farming techniques, which speed things up and make things more efficient, but do not take care of the soil. And that soil is really the, the gent, like, it is the fire, it is the ashes, it is the phoenix, if you will, where life is goes when it's over and is reborn again from those ashes. I feel like the soil is the magic element of everything. And if we take care of our soil like we organic farmers do, <laughs> everything becomes better. Our vegetable become healthier for us. And that is why I really believe a lot of people around the world are becoming less healthy in first world nations. There is malnutrition rampant in places like America and other first world nations that eat lots of meat, lots of bread and lots of processed vegetables and not a lot of fresh organic food. So take care of yourself and your environment and your future, eat local organic. In Japan, things are really, really bad. As John touched upon, our self-sufficiency is way, way down. This is a 2015 report from the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries here in Japan. And it just shows the trend. If it was like this seven years ago, I guarantee you it's not any better right now. I've heard it's down to about 33%. So we're in big trouble if, if the... Uh, if the feces really hits the fan, we are really gonna have to change our diets. And that's why I say, change them right now. Eat the traditional Japanese diet, lots of vegetables, a bit of rice, a bit of fish if you like it, lots of tofu, and you'll be much healthier and so will the planet and we will be self-sufficient. <laughs> the amount of farms that have closed in the past 15 or 20 years is astounding. 30% have closed while 240% increase in, in uh, corporate farms, which do not consider themselves stewards of the soil. So please try to buy local organic when you can. And look at this. This includes conventional farmers. The average age of farmers is above 65 years old. This is backbreaking, sweaty work that people cannot do well into their 70s. 
And that's what they're being asked to do. So try to get some younger people involved. I think it's great to get them started early. That is the secret. Not only diversification, but education about what we're eating, what we could eat, how we should eat it, and why we should be growing more food. That's my message from Midori Farm. Now, I have a good friend in Kehoku. Her name is Chie, and she's a wonderful farmer. She specializes in baby leaves and things like that. Uh, but she's really diverse. She can do a lot of different things. And these are some of the things that she does to make her business work. This is her website. Um, she's uh, able to be reached at, at, at this place. <clears throat> and you can read all about what she's doing and how she got started. And these are some of the photos that talk about what she's doing. I'm going to read from a script that she gave me. <clears throat> So this is in Kehoku, where I'm farming as well. And she's in Kehoku. And this is, she holds a small marché or farmer's market in Kehoku, uh, right in front of these uh, Michi no Eki. And with, together with a bunch of other farmers, they set up a little marché to help sell their vegetables and get people to know about what they're doing. And I think they're quite successful. A lot of tourists come through there and like to stop at the Michi no Eki and pick up some nice fresh vegetables. And again, as John said, usually they have a small card with their photos and their story behind it. So people know who grows what they eat. This is a DAX. This is another group she's, she's part of. And, and they usually operate in Kyoto City itself. <clears throat> they, they met about six years ago and joined the Academy of Farmers Economy. And last year they met again at the Agribusiness Cafe, which is organized by Kyoto City. Farmers and many companies, <coughs> like banks, tour companies, hotels, supermarkets, and Good Nature Station, where they held the market, they joined and helped create this new business together. And through this, they held the market in front of Good Nature Station, as you can see right here. <clears throat> Same kind of idea, lots of fresh vegetables out there with the story behind them. And this would be Chie San's little display right here. Now you can see, of course, this is all wrapped in plastic, or a lot of it is. I've, gone, I've been to Japanese farmers markets before, and I have had a full table of fresh vegetables, no plastic, at the beginning of the day, only to have a full table of vegetables without plastic at the end of the day because the guy next to me or the woman next to me <coughs> had neatly wrapped in plastic and was sold out. Same vegetables, same price. So it's just the way people have to sell here. I don't think it's a personal choice. But along with their vegetable sales, they collaborate with some other groups, perhaps talking about campsites or homemade crafts. They have little events for the kids where you can dig up your own potatoes. That looks so interesting. I'm gonna try to copy that someday. And they also join with uh, food preparers. I think this is a good way to diversify, especially for some of your vegetables that aren't quite as nice as they could or should be, that are perfectly healthy and delicious, just need a little attention in a fry pan, and then they're good to eat. And here's another connection she's made with Neon Diner. Another great connection, as I said, uh, to try to to really connect with other farmers and other groups who can support you. Sorry, Heather, I know you don't like that word, but I'm going to just use it anyway. <laughs> All right. The next guy I want to talk about, Damien Hohaya. He's another superstar in my book. This guy is fantastic. And I'm going to have to share something else uh, because he and I are both struggling technology-wise, but I just wanted to show you some of his photos. Uh, and talk about his story. So Tiki Farms, which is the name of his farm, started off more or less as a platform to establish a link with Maori farmers in New Zealand, which uh, his, are his roots, and Japanese Kyoto farmers to share and exchange farming techniques, ideas, customs, and practices. Also to preserve traditional heritage seeds important to the Maori people. A relationship he hopes would over time lead to a better understanding and a collaboration and application of both farming practices and techniques. Damien has also been aware for the need to reduce 
reuse and recycle anything and everything on the farm to hopefully with effort little by little to make the environment a little bit better. This autumn, he will launch Peru, 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 Peru Peki Project, which means Maori potatoes grown in a bag, which these fertilizer bags that he uses, he'd like to recycle and reuse. And a very important traditional Maori practice, which started 10 years ago, was the giving <clears throat> of excess vegetables to support the local community, for example, struggling families, the elderly, <clears throat> even exchanging produce with other farmers with what they don't have. The concept of selling vegetables is a custom Maori people just don't have, but it has taken me, it has taken him over 10 years to accept it as a passive income. So Tiki Farm supports two local charities. Furiai Mana Shokudo, a food kitchen in Kyoto which feeds children and their families, and Nogiku So, a shelter of over 30 families of single mothers and their children. He started supporting them last year and has delivered over one and a half tons of organic vegetables to their doors. This year, with a well established relationship of trust, the charities now participate fully in a garden therapy program where kids and their caregivers play an active role in planting farm maintenance and harvesting from start to finish throughout the seasons, <clears throat> of which has had great success according to their supervisors. As he has a full-time job making money off the farm, all of this work on the farm is done in his free time and on his days off. It is something that he is passionate about, but it is a lot of work doing it alone. If there are others who would like to take part and volunteer of their time to a good cause, please feel free to contact him and try to make his, their community a better place. Last year, he had successful meetings with the government representatives of the local welfare branch and secured some funding and support from a humanitarian aid organization who is keen to release generous funds to support these causes. John, I know you love that picture. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Love it. <laughs> you can see that Damien is really passionate about his work on the farm, about his support for the community, and just in his efforts for the environment and our future as well. This guy is a superstar. He gets horse manure from the local horse trainers uh, association and he composts himself. And he basically just uses that and some homemade bokashi on his beautiful farms out there in Ohara, Kyoto, Japan. I recommend looking him up, checking him out, visiting him if you've got the chance and letting him know if you can come out and help him because this is a guy doing the right thing in the right place at the right time. These are some sweet potato slips. I know this because I bought a whole bunch of them from him and I'm growing them out on my farm. Not only that, but I shared them with the local uh, elderly uh, community leader and he was tickled pink because sweet potato slips were really expensive and scarce this year. It was a bad year for him. As Heather mentioned, we had a lot of weather issues earlier this year. And I think that was probably one of the main factors in reducing the number available. But as you can see, he's killing it out there. He's growing everything and anything. He's got fruit trees. He's got kids coming out. He's got his flowers going. He starts his own seeds. This guy's a superstar. Please check him out. I'm going to go back to share my screen with his information, just so you can see that again. This is how to get in touch with him. If you're on, if you're watching this in video, you can stop and pause it and write this down. Otherwise, I'll put it in the chat and make sure it's in the show notes. Well, John, those are the superstars that I've found that wanted to participate for today, not just uh, Greg and Heather and yourself, but I know you've got a couple more people. So are yep. you ready to go with your- Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 sure. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna um, go ahead and spotlight you. Oh, go ahead, John, did you have a question? Yeah, um, that presentation was great. And it's amazing just to see how uh, one guy just, um, Damien, he's just one guy and he's doing all that. 
And it's just, that's phenomenal. That's so inspirational to see how it's just like one guy with one mindset and with what looks like a ton of motivation and see what he can do with the community. It's amazing. Great stuff. And again, um, question, he's not bringing any money home from this or very little. He does it for the quality of life. Hmm. That's good. Basically, um, I'm supporting others. Yeah. Um, uh, um, um, the question about your presentation, Chuck, um, you showed that graph about uh, Japan's uh, food self-sufficiency. Yes, uh, sir. What do you think? Uh, what do you think is um, is the is the would be the most effective way that this country could actually increase its food self-sufficiency? Like the most effective way. Education, education. I talk about those statistics every chance I get because people just don't know. I've presented to foreigners and Japanese, same thing. And that's why I often put the for the Japanese uh, data up there and I translate into English some of the parts for the foreigners because the Japanese have no idea about this. Even though the Ministry of Agriculture puts this out every year, who looks at them? So I really just think bringing this truths to the people about what is the situation with our food and does it have to be this way? And what is our health issues? What, what, what are our choices? What are some better weight based? What are some ways to make things better? I think education is the first and last step because once we begin the cycle of uh, education with young people, they will retain that information and they will bring that forward throughout their whole lives. My son has been eating organic food basically his whole life. Heather, I know your children, super healthy into it. It's worth it. It is worth it to give them this experience. Let them try what a real carrot tastes like. My gosh, it doesn't taste like the carrot in the supermarket, you might as well eat the packaging for all the nutrition and flavor it's got. Really. So I really believe it's all about exposure. Um, and that's all we can do because government legislation, that's out of my hands. Protesting, never been my bag, baby. I am all into just demonstrating what's possible through doing it and letting people know about it. That's great stuff. I mean, um, um, that like, um, ties in sort of really closely with my teaching work here in um, in Tokyo, where I sort of taught mainly children. And the thing is, um, what I've sort of realised is that um, that um, getting um, getting people to grow food it involves um, basically like a two-step process. Uh, 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 another first step is to actually teach them the skills, how to sow seeds, how to transplant seedlings, how to protect um, the leaves from insects, that kind of thing. But two, um, to get to actually get them to start growing food and continue growing food, you've got to motivate them. So it's like skills and motivation. Um, I can teach skills to anyone. I taught my um, my daughter to, uh, to uh, um, successfully sow seeds when she was about four years old. Um, she picked that up just like that. Um, she knows how to grow food, but she doesn't at the moment. And I think, um, like I said, basically, um, I'm teaching the skills first, then the motivation. And I think, uh, uh, what you've just been talking about, um, like about getting people involved and um, um, talking about food production too. That's key. Plus tasting as well. It's like you said as well about um, do people know what a real carrot tastes like? Give them some real food and that will hopefully motivate them. And ideally, and one step further, give them some organic food and some non-organic food and get them just to taste the difference. That'll probably be quite a quick process. And get them to taste what, and get them to taste what real fruit tastes like. Then show them how to grow it. It's not too difficult. So yeah, I I think that what you're on about there is great. Good stuff. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I know I, uh, I think there's something in the chat that Carla wants to talk about someone. But John, you've got the stage for now, and at the end, uh, we'll let Carla jump on. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, so um, just quickly, my part of the presentation basically it's um, I'm going to be talking about different ways that ordinary people can connect with farmers. Uh, so I'll just uh, quickly share my screen. What I sort of basically got here is about five or six different ways that people can connect. And the first one is what we're doing right now. Um, basically, I'm looking up um, online uh, farming related events and joining them, just like this fantastic farming one. And like we've all been doing for the last hour, 
you basically get to meet people who have similar mindsets and skills and ambitions. Um, number two on the screen is join uh, farming related uh, social media sites and you'll meet more people like us. And I've listed about eight of them there with the, uh, the membership numbers next to them. And personally, I found uh, Japan Gardening is a pretty good one. There's a lot of serious gardeners and farmers on it, and they're asking the big questions about how to grow food, how to protect their crops against insects, that kind of thing. Um, and that's, yeah, it's regularly used by lots of people who grow their own food, not just, yeah, uh, basically like Japan wide. Uh, number two, uh, Food Haven Sokyo, that's my page. Uh, we talk a lot about food there. That's mainly uh, connecting Tokyo-based um, urban farmers, and it's a place where people can ask questions, get answers, and share what they're growing, share photos, and so on. Uh, sustainable cities. Um, uh, um, uh, urban food, that's um, also my site. That's more focused on sustainability and growing food. Uh, urban Farming Tokyo, uh, run by a Belgian guy, I forget what his name is, 831 members. That's not so active. I'd certainly recommend the first one, Japan Gardening. Uh, Yokosuka Gardening Club, it's run by, it's basically, it's a whole lot of US, it's, um, it's largely uh, families of US uh, service members at the Yokosuka base. Um, and a lot of people basically give stuff away when they're moving out or moving on. Uh, foreign Farms of Japan, I don't know how long that's been around. I found out that one through you, Chuck. That's a small one in uh, Japanese farming style. Let's say agricultural co-op down the bottom and sustainable living in Japan. More, more broader subjects, not just growing food. So yeah, um, the first uh, way that people can connect with farmers is just to find them online. The next way is one of my all-time favorites, community gardening. Um, I've been renting uh, plots in community gardens here in Tokyo for nine years, and it changed my life, totally changed my life, as I basically got to grow food myself, and then I uh, basically developed the experience and the skills to start teaching it, which launched my uh, um, urban farming career. Um, some quick points about this. Um, this is mainly in Tokyo, I'm not sure what the stats would be like outside Tokyo, where there's typically more space. But here in Tokyo, plot sizes, typically three by five square meters, which is only slightly wider than a standard car park. Uh, rental period starts from mid March and goes until January 31st the following year, so it's about nine or 10 months, goes right through winter. Uh, rental fee, 5,500 yen, and that's per year. That's not per month, that's per year. And um, in the past, I've grown north of 25,000 yen worth of food. So that's a great way to go. And what's supplied, you get access to the tool shed, you get uh, spades, hose, forks, trowels, watering containers. I think some places have gloves, uh, gloves too. And um, the urban farmers need to supply all the other stuff like seeds and soil if they want to change the soil and seedlings. And uh, yeah, so with these community gardens, you can grow whatever you like, but you're expected to grow vegetables. But if you're someone like me who likes to add a bit of color, like you might want to, uh, yeah, and you can plant some flowers too. And you might want to plant flowers for companion planting too. Uh, like for example, if, if you want to plant a specific flower next to a specific vegetable to ward off a specific insect, that's all cool. But you do it yourself. And the community gardens here in Tokyo, they're largely, um, um, the people who, who manage the plots are largely elderly men, uh, widowed men. And these people know how to grow food. They're really experienced at what they do. Um, what do community gardens look like? They're usually right next to streets. You just walk off the street and into a plot. And they're usually uh, like a standard house size or larger. Um, the last community garden I was using, it was, uh, it was half of a, uh, um, a, a fruit orchard that the owner basically subdivided and donated to the city or donated to the town on the condition that it was converted into a community garden. Um, I took these photos yesterday and you'll, yeah, and you'll notice um, a photo down the bottom right. 
Um, and just over to the right, there's a bunch of tomato plants and there's a covering on them. I just noticed that's, that's a plastic sheet. And I'm pretty sure that the farmer put that over there to protect the tomatoes from splitting during the rainy season, um, during the rainy season that never happened. <laughs> but that's pretty cool. And that would work because tomatoes split when they get, when their soil around the roots gets too wet. Um, here's some more random photos of community gardens and people, yeah, so people can basically grow what they like. Um, but you never know what the person the previous year uh, did. Uh, that's unless you were using the same garden and you look around the garden to see what people are doing. Um, yep, and this here, this is a, these are all community gardens around my town. This one here is the last one that I used. It's got a, uh, these gardens, they all have a tap and water and containers, but most people just take their own tools. And yep, yeah, I'm not sure who this little guy is. <laughs> uh, yep, yeah, actually, okay, that's my son, Tyler. Um, yeah, kids love it. And it, it's a, and these community gardens are a really good way to teach kids how to grow food and get them involved at a, a young age. This is a friend who I uh, let use part of my community garden. She grew a ton of food and just a few square feet. And um, yeah, I've interestingly had a couple of uh, film crews come to my community garden to film too, which has been pretty cool. Uh, I think because this gardening is so rare in, in Tokyo that gardens are like, wow, that's really special. Um, it's kind of strange. Um, how to apply for a community garden. Now, this is what happens here in Tokyo. I'm, Pretty confident it's a similar procedure in different parts of uh, different cities around Japan. And what you normally do is you check for your local community newspaper at your city hall, train station platforms, libraries, and other city uh, facilities in the first two weeks of January. And you will likely see on the front cover of your local city newspaper, you'll likely see a photo of a happy family growing food. That's the one to get. That's the issue to get. And inside you'll find the, the application procedure to apply for a community garden. Then you basically normally go to your local city hall and apply. That's the application form in the middle there. And then there's a lottery. Um, and the winners get told, uh, they get advised by, uh, by postcard. And if you win, you go back to your city hall, pay the fee. And then you get a little membership card and you can use that for the whole rental period, which starts mid-March and goes until January 31st, the following year. Um, yeah, and it's game changing. It's fantastic. In fact, this is how it changed the game for me. I um, unbelievably, and I was a little shocked about this, but I became a, um, a food producer at, in uh, Tokyo just by planting some tomato plants and growing nearly 2,000 tomatoes in, in one summer. And then having so many, and cucumbers too, and just finding I was giving them away because I just grew so many in just a few square meters. So that's community gardens, and these are pretty common around Tokyo, but um, there's many, I think there's quite a few towns around Tokyo that don't have any. Uh, but I've personally met someone who's from the neighboring town where they don't have any community gardens. He came and successfully applied to rent a plot in the community garden in my town, which was next to his town, and he got it. So I think you can you can basically cross borders. Um, another type of community garden which has popped up, um, Shiabatake. Uh, and this is a company, and they're running these um, Shiabatake gardens in Saitama, Chiba, and Kanagawa. And um, it's more for um, but beginner garden, uh, gardeners who don't have much idea about how to grow food. More expensive monthly fee, plot size, about the same as the, as the regular community gardens. But the difference is they supply everything. They supply seeds, they supply seedlings, um, they supply tools, watering containers and all that. And really cool, they have um, on-site trainers four times a week. So if you don't have a clue about how to grow tomatoes, you can just go and ask one of their trainers and they'll come to your plot and they'll show you how to grow food. Um, it's more expensive. And like I said, it's more for 
Big Gene Gardeners. And um, there's one popped up in my town. This is a photo taken yesterday. One huge difference between a, sh a share pataka and a regular pataka or community garden is that it seems that the people who rent plots in a um, share pataka all do the same thing. And I was really amazed a few months ago, uh, uh, late last year, where I um, just checked out this local share pataka that you can see here. And every single garden was growing tomatoes and I think it was broccoli. Every single patch had those two vegetables. And they must have, and the um, garden coordinators must have just been handing out seedlings and showing how to grow them. And what I didn't see was plant diversity. Like no one was growing like Swiss chard, no one was growing pumpkin, no one was growing like uh, baby leaves. It was all just the same plants in every plot, which was pretty discouraging. But if I was a first time plant uh, gardener, that would probably be something that I would need some training. So yeah, um, sharebataki.com if you're interested. Um, another way to get in, to get up close with farmers is uh, uh, farmers markets. Uh, here in Tokyo, we've got uh, about two, which is pretty sad. Uh, Oyama Farmers Market um, held every Sunday. That's happening right now. And a new one that's opened up in Ikebukuro. Um, they've got a farmers market every weekend. I think they've been closed during COVID, but I think they're reopening now. And another way to get involved in farming is to do it yourself. Basically talk among your friends and your workmates and say, hey, who wants to start a garden? Do you want to grow some food? And if so, have you got some sunlit space that we can both use to grow food? And that sunlit space may be uh, your friend's rooftop or a car park that they don't use next to their house or a patio or balcony, wherever um, the sun shines. And it could even be some uh, place around your town that's underutilized, like a car park that's not used very often or an uh, unused bit of grass. And what you can do is just say to your friend or, or your workmate, hey, you've got a spare rooftop. There's nothing on it. Do you want to grow food up there? Get the tools, share the skills, share the learning, share the food. Pretty simple. Um, talking about skills, if you're interested, I, uh, I think most of you know I teach. Um, I've got a whole lot of... Um, um, urban farming packages and on and online and on-site training that I provide to teach you whatever you need to know about how to grow food. Um, I've got a few uh, Japanese and English uh, bilingual gardening resources if kanji is not quite your thing. Okay, so that's the idea. That's some ideas for how ordinary people can connect uh, with farmers and a couple of farms I'd like to introduce now. One of them is Kasamatsu Farm in Kanagawa, just outside Tokyo. Um, husband and wife team, they set up their farm after the big earthquake and they've been growing organic vegetables. They do permaculture and they've got chickens. They've got chickens as well. They've got really nice chickens. It grows really nice eggs. Uh, Kasamatsufarm.com. Uh, Byron Nagy there to the left, his wife Kauri with the eggs. They've got chickens. Nice eggs. I had no idea that eggs could be, that chicken eggs could be blue, but they grow them. Um, yep. Um, and they've got a, a online store that they kicked off when COVID took off. Um, farm number two is in Shiwa, Iwate Prefecture. Um, Shiwa Green Farm. Uh, Brian and Mio Sok, uh, can't quite see the last name. Yep, and they grow a massive range of vegetables, root vegetables, and fruit. Absolutely massive range. And they, they promote it and sell it through their local farmers markets. Um, they use permaculture, they use permaculture and no and uh, no till techniques. Um, and they sell their stuff through farmers market stores and a French restaurant, a French run restaurant. Um, Greg. I made a couple of pages about you, just in case you uh, couldn't show up today, but you did. Thanks a lot. Greg Leverton, of course, <laughs> he's with us. Farm Fresh here, some of the box vegetables that he sells. All good. Plastic free, Greg, plastic free. That's a key. That's a good point. That's a real good sales point. 
And I notice on your website, you've got a really good page about how to preserve produce without plastic. Fascinating stuff. You should put more stuff like that onto your website to keep people there longer. Great stuff. Okay, so that's my bit of the presentation. Uh, back to you, Chuck. Chuck. <laughs> oh, hang on. Yeah, Chuck, hey there. Chuck. I am here, John. That was amazing. I always love seeing what you're doing in the city there and getting all that explanation about how to how to get in on those community gardens and everything else. I thought that was fantastic. Um, I really hope that more people can get involved with that. Because as you said, it's getting people involved, getting them into the habit of it uh, and motivated to do it. And I got to say, probably for Heather and I, we have a very similar story starting about 12 years ago, probably just futzing around something to do, see what's happening. And then it just takes hold, you know, in a year or two, it's just suddenly like, I don't know what I was doing before I was doing this, but it wasn't at all any good. You know, this is the thing for me. Uh, it's so, like a drug. Uh, it, 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 it's very addictive. It's very, very addictive. So for good or for bad. Um, yeah. So um, we can open up the uh, the mics. And if anybody has questions, maybe Solvig, you might have some questions. Uh, I know that you always have asked some really good questions. Yeah, I wanted to kind of hear what Carla was want, what was going to say about she has a, a small business she wanted to introduce. I'd like to hear what what she has going on because I've got something that I want to throw in there too, but I want to hear her. Thank you, Solvig. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, I don't know if I can jump in right now. It's okay. Yeah. You guys, uh, uh, I was yeah. expecting a different type of event and suddenly <laughs> I'm here in the middle of like professional farmers. Uh, it's really good to hear to hear from all of you. I think you will do a great job. It's sincerely, uh, I tried to grow some vegetables here on my, on my veranda thinking it was uh, it, somehow easy because I used to see my grandfather doing it so i thought i could do it but it's really hard <laughs> and uh, so uh, what i wanted to say is that i think online presence is really important uh, really really important uh, last year we started me and my husband we started an online school and uh, it's kind of slowly <laughs> slowly growing. Also, one of the reasons is about COVID. Most of the families that we had, uh, our communities <clears throat> online were established uh, in Japan. And so we couldn't uh, grow much uh, because everybody was trying to leave and they are still trying to leave. From the groups that were taking classes from our school, maybe 70% of them are now out of the country and not interested in learning nothing of this. So we are trying to grow from there. Uh, but I think uh, whatever online feature that any of you choose, I think it's fantastic. I think, uh, I really think it will be a trend gardening and growing vegetables with the climate change. I've been a vegan uh, for 15 years now. So somehow I've been following all this process. I think it's important that we stop using plastics. It's really urgent. Uh, I don't agree that we have to cope with the demands of the Japanese uh, buyers community um, uh, only buying vegetables um that are packed uh, in plastic i think the the uh, japanese uh, people have to have to overcome this uh, stress and we have to try it so also our role um, since we are able to read english and know other things from abroad um, to also educate um people uh, about uh, uh, the dimension of the plastic that is so huge and it's uh, overwhelming and we cannot we cannot keep on like this if you buy any pack of chocolates is all wrapped in more <laughs> more it never ends you buy a pack of chocolates and it's wrapped in more and more and more and more plastic and we have to try to finish this and say to people that it's fine to eat as long as we try to 
control the, all the chemicals and stuff that you know that is hard, uh, you know better than me, uh, how hard it is to, um, to control. Uh, but also insects are part, of, are, part of the, are part of the system. So how to take advantage uh, of the situation in a natural way, I'm sure there are other ways uh, that uh, um, we don't have to uh, just erase them from the, from the, um, from the uh, ecological environment where we live. I'm not sure if this is like this or not, but uh, <clears throat> so what I wanted to say is that we have this school, we are trying to grow when we, I already told, talked with John about this before. Uh, it didn't uh, made much, uh, um, we couldn't go ahead with an online event about this, but we are uh, trying to uh, raise awareness about climate change and uh, um, gardening and uh, this. So we are willing to accept any of the proposals. Of course, we have to talk about numbers, but uh, basically this. It's an online school where uh, from zero to 12 years old, and uh, we have several classes, all classes that can support. And uh, mainly, we also have uh, classes that are not present in the Japanese um, education system. So we figure out we are a family, we have a child, we figure out that there was some lack of information in the Japanese school system on the public schools, and we try to supply this, let's say, alternative, alternative information. And uh, we have some groups where we, where we try to talk about uh, uh, many of these issues, and now those groups are very, very like, uh, I don't know, uh, not almost empty, but this, we had like 5,000 uh, families in one group and uh, uh, 2,500 in another group and 600 in another group. Uh, so uh, now it's kind of trying to flow, but very slow, but uh, trying to get to the Japanese public right now. So we would need someone that speaks Japan, can speak Japanese and can explain all these matters to Japanese families. Okay. Can I jump in because Great, Carla. I really appreciate Carla, it. Carla, you and I. Uh, you Solvik, just, a, just a minute. Solvik, just, just a minute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I want, I want Solvik to yes. say her piece, of course, but I just wanted to say one thing. And Carla, that's www.japanvirtuallearning.com. Yes, right? yes. So we'll put that in the show notes for we you. We always check the teachers. Actually, uh, my husband tell me that I'm too kibishi, too kibishi, <laughs> too, uh, uh, too not problematic, but I'm too kibishi with the teachers and that's why we cannot gather more teachers. But uh, the reason is that uh, uh, learning online and teaching online nowadays, it demands more than just conversation and just uh, um, it needs another approach and, uh, um, and that's the reason why uh, we don't have more teachers and more approach because I always try to check the teachers and see who they are and, uh, and everything. But we've been having some classes. Some of the classes are not on the website because they are single classes. If they are single events like this one, we don't put them on the on the website. Um, can you put the That's website into the chat um, down the bottom, Carla? Can you put the website? It's, it's already, already there. Oh, is it? oh. It's already Actually, it's it was a direct everyone. message. Sorry, sorry. Actually, Carla, you just sent that to me, not to everyone, but I'll make sure it comes Yes, out. I'll put here, okay? I'll put here. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much for all your effort. I think it's really, I think it's really a big effort um Thank but you, don't Bob. doubt that, that will be very needed in the future with all the climate change that um expect us is not is not going to be a fantastic future unless we can overcome all these uh, climate things so um i think uh, farming connected with the 
online, it will be the way to go. Excellent. Sorry to interrupt <laughs> again. We've only got five minutes left. Actually, we're five minutes over. So I do want to share the stage with Solveig because she's been yes, waiting patiently. But John, did you have something else to add? Uh, no, no, no. I'm just waiting for Solveig. Go, Solveig. <laughs> the floor is yours. Maybe, maybe Heather has rest. something to add after Solveig, but okay. Solveig, you've got the stage. Yeah. Cool. I can talk fast. Um, I know how to do this. So Carla, what you're doing dovetails with what I do. I do color pencil illustration for ocean conservation. I've been working on this for the last 12 years. Prior to that, okay, I'm going to be really bold here. I'm going to show you this one here. I, don't mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. This is called the ice hole. This is the polar bear mother with her cubs and the seal coming up. And so I work in color pencil illustration, but I also want to be mixing. I was an English tutor here in Japan for, oh, I've been teaching for what, 25 years altogether, now English conversation. I've lived in Japan for more than 20 years. I'm fluent in Japanese. My whole focus is to get kids bonded to the climate change issues, to conservation, so we and are on the same track. We are exactly on the same page. And yes, yes. Teaching gardening in English. Here's where the marketing comes in. Japanese parents are willing to spend money on getting their kids English education. It is true. Yes, yes. If it's yes. English education. We are now trying to get more involved into the Japanese community. Yeah. And to, to so what I, my, my, my direction for this is to use art, to teach art in English, to teach conservation in English, to get kids involved and to get them to where, you know, to where they are learning English at the same time that they're learning about conservation through art. Because the best way to learn about nature is with a hand and a pencil. So yes. art and gardening and English is a really perfect combination. Yes, yes. Get kids it's involved true. in nature illustration. Get them, get them a little sketch <clears> with <throat> a pencil. Draw the vegetables, draw the fruits, draw the seedlings, draw the seeds. Learn to teach them how to say it in English. Because the parents are willing to spend money to get their kids English education because their English education here, to be very blunt, and I mean no disrespect, sucks. Yes, yes. Agree. They come out of English education here in Japan after 10 years of English and can't speak English. This is very wrong. So they've got, so we have an opportunity here as Gaijin to meld this. And what I want to add into what I'm trying to add into my online classes, which I fumble, I'm terrible at the online stuff. I come from originally, I'm born in Sweden raised in Norway and Canada. I lived in Hawaii for 18 years. I've got friends and family around. And I know probably Carly, you have too. So why don't we hook up, use the technology we have yes, and yes. hook up the kids here with kids in other countries <clears throat> as well to really make it like a, an organic thing where kids, because they are the ones that are gonna have to eat it when we screw up more than even what you we screwed up so far. I watched a documentary on plastic yesterday that just broke my heart. Yes, yes, we have to stop this. It's urgent, it's really, really it urgent. Totally urgent, but the Japanese, the thing with the Japanese is they have a cultural, deep, long, centuries old culture of purity through Shinto. So the whole concept of using I think it's, it's also connected to with the keep it pure to keep it pure to keep you know the, mm. the, the, everything the yes, purity, yes. to overcome that they have to do really it because we cannot live like this hard. every time we go to the combini they give us a new plastic spoon uh, <laughs> and if you don't say anything they don't even ask it's really it's really troublesome they don't like, and they, they don't like to change. They're very conservative. They don't like to change, but we have an opportunity here. Yes. So what I was going to ask before I sort of leaped in here, I'm going to say this real fast. So I'm just wondering, Chuck and the rest of you guys, is there 
any market for teaching gardening in English to kids, whether on an yeah. online forum. I and think John is doing it very well. Doing yes. I'm decade, planting yeah. a seed there. I'm planting a seed because yeah. I think this is something that the kids need gardening and the kids need English. The parents are happy to pay for kids learning English. That's just the reality. I've got my kids right next door here, but I teach three kids once a week here. And we, we um, plant stuff. We <laughs> talk about all kinds of stuff. So that was that. That's my okay. Three minutes. I did it. Well done, Solvig. You thanks did well, Solvig. <laughs> and Carla, thanks so much for everything you added as well. I think you two put, putting your heads together is a great idea. Yeah. Please report back to us. Let us know how it goes. We'd love to have you on another episode where you're the stars. Well, I want to get into your SOS program also, that one, the sustainability Green thing. Screening. Yes, yeah. Solvig, for sure. Yeah, because for sure. The, the, the art is, is really valuable in that absolutely i think that's a great idea you'd be you'd be a welcome addition i'm sorry to have to cut things short um, but i really did feel like today we, we did flesh out a lot of information and we got a lot of other people some exposure they may not otherwise have had john is to thank for most of that it was his brainchild to have this episode john thank you so so much for creating this yeah, thank you john. Right. um yeah, I've got to say, um, um, this is like the fourth uh, fantastic farming um, event that Chuck and I have run, and I think it's been the best. It's just been so many great ideas have been shared by people who know what they're talking about and who have dreams that we can make and that uh, uh, we can make real. And one thing that sort of really came to my mind was the power of uh, collaboration. This kind of thing brings people yeah, like us yeah. together. We've all got the same general thrust of what we want the future to look like. And by having more um, events like this, just this one, uh, the last 90 minutes has been fantastic. I've learned so much. It's been wonderful. Um, and we've all been contributing because we've all got different lifestyles, different experiences, different expectations. Let's do this again. This is great. Yeah. I'd like to it's give really another good. special thanks to, uh, to uh, Damien Hohai at Tiki Farms <laughs> and Chie at Hamachi Noen uh, for adding their information. And Heather, thank you so much for joining us live and being on with us. It's actually been over a hundred minutes now, and but it's been well worth it. And uh, Great. <laughs> Greg, of course, and the two thank other you. farmers that you presented on, John, thanks so much for your information. <laughs> Carla and Solvig, thanks for joining us. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube again, Thanks a lot. Check out some other videos. Give us some advice on what we can do to improve. Um, look for our next one. And if you're out at the Gion Matsuri next Sunday in the heat, look for me on one of the floats. I'll be pushing it in my little outfit and uh, sweating oh, it up. Okay. Oh, Gion Matsuri is next Sunday. It's next Sunday. That's right. First oh. time in three years. So anyway. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right. I, I think my Thank farming you, in the Thank sun has really prepared me for this. So we'll yeah. see. We'll see. But thanks, everybody. Yeah. Have a great yeah. weekend, the rest of your weekend, and hope to see you next time. John and I'll be putting out another one probably yeah. next yeah. month. Not yeah. sure what it'll be about, but I'm mm -hmm. sure it'll be a great one just yeah. like today. And that's work all. in progress. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Great to meet you all. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you yeah. so much, yeah. everybody. Thank okay. you. Yeah, see you later. See you next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>